What do CEOs need to know about sales these days? A lot. Outdated sales strategies and tactics plague most companies today. Listen to what innovative CEOs and experts have to say about how to change all that with Sales Talk for CEOs. Welcome to Sales Talk for CEOs. You know I am always excited when I find a great CEO story, and especially when it's a female CEO. So love all you guys out there too, but love to get a great female CEO on the show. So this particular guest has a very interesting path to CEO, and I can't wait for her to share um, she had no idea at all that she would be taking this particular career path. And so it's going to be interesting to hear how she got where she is. Um, welcome to the show, Corey Munchback. She is the CEO of Blue Conic. So excited to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I am excited to jump into your story. I've been following you. I've been reading about you. And um, I just really love the way you have wandered into this <laughs> CEO position. So first, let's just start by having you tell everyone, what, it, what does Blue Conic do and wh who's your audience and what do they buy from you? Sure thing. So Blueconic is a customer data platform. We are a subset of marketing technology, which is a very big and loud space for anyone who might be in it. Um, our kind of ideal customer profile are upper mid market and smaller enterprise companies who sell to consumers or are publishers themselves. So think VF Corp, Heineken, Hearst um, are one of some of the many customers. We have almost 300 of them. And they use our technology really to understand who their consumers are, whether they are shoppers, readers, or other. Um, and they use that insight to make sure that they are having valuable conversations with those consumers to drive their businesses forward. So it's a really exciting, dynamic space to be in. Um, it's been amazing to work with all the customers that we have. And as you said, I've been with the company for a long time. So it's particularly gratifying for me to sort of see where we are and also how much we still have to go uh, over the time that I've been with the organization. Yeah, important technology. I mean, uh, brands need to understand what their consumers are up to, right? That's very much so critical these days. All right. So you've been the CEO for just over a year. And uh, that's exciting. But you've been with a company about seven years, right? Uh, a little more, actually nine. I joined in January oh of 2015. So we're, we're pushing a decade. Oh, my goodness. Exciting. Well, let's start by having you take us back to just before you joined the company. What were you doing and what compelled you to join Blue Conic? Yeah, it's um, it's a very unexpected story. You used the word wander, and I think that's a good example of uh, <laughs> where I was, and in a lot of ways, somehow um, how it feels still. So I was an analyst at Forrester Research, which was amazing. I had been with the organization a little over four years. I'd started as a research associate in the CMO and marketing leadership practice, so I had this incredible bird's eye view into what was top of mind for the marketing leadership and. Um, CMOs of the biggest brands and, and companies in the world. And so Forrester works with just an amazing array of customers and getting really deep into what their priorities are. That really teed me up well to then start thinking about how does the strategies and challenges and things that the marketing leadership team are talking about, how does that translate into technology strategy? What does that look like? How are those things connected? And so I had the opportunity to move into the customer insights team, which then allowed me to write the first wave on the marketing clouds back in 2012, 2013, which was really deep into really a critical phenomenon now that we've seen over the last almost 20 years um, of how that's shaped marketing tech and how customers uh, do that. And so that was what I was doing. And then I really wanted to just get more into the weeds. It's amazing being an analyst, but by definition, you're kind of at 30,000 feet, right? You're trying to get a big picture. You're trying to understand how all the pieces fit together. And I just wanted an opportunity to get really, really into it, roll up my sleeves and see if I could figure out some of this for myself. And the um, opportunity presented itself to go work for Blue Conic, which at the time had just been incorporated uh, with a Series A investment. Our co-founder team from the Netherlands had moved to Boston. I met them through a mutual acquaintance through Forrester, and they wanted me to come work for them. I was employee 17, and that's where this uh, this all started. 
Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Love Forrester and all the research that they do. And uh, it's so interesting. And I, I think because you're so curious, right? So you dove into all that information. And they're like, I need to know more about this. I got to dig deeper, right? Um, which caused you to, to get into the insights group and then say, I want to go work in this industry, right? That's right. Uh, that's right. It's a, it's funny. Our one of our core values to this day at the company is is uh, curiosity, and that was one of the things that I got to be a part of when you're early and founding those values and principles that the rest of the company gets built on. But yeah, it, it, I've always been someone who feels like I need to really understand something deeply in order to then kind of come back out and see, oh, okay, this is how the system works. This is how the pieces fit together. Um, kind of moving between those very low altitudes and high altitudes gives me a lot of joy. I find a lot of fun in that. Um, and so that was a great big shift. Um, yeah. And I kind of got hurled into it right from day one. So, and it feels like it hasn't kind of let up since. <laughs> yeah. What did the founder do to lure you in? What were you attracted to about that company? Honestly, it was totally different, right? So Forrester is this global brand. Everybody knows Forrester, you know, big and rigorous with just this amazing kind of history. And Bluconic uh, had no brand reputation whatsoever. As I mentioned, our founding team was Dutch, is Dutch, um, had moved over from the Netherlands. So not just a small country, but small country in Europe to come to the US. And so the opportunity for me was really to get in at the ground level to solve all these problems for the first time. We didn't even know what we were going to be. One of my kind of first big assignments for the reason for being of my job, I started as the director of product marketing was, are we going to be this thing called the CDP that just came out or are we something else entirely? So these really amazing existential important decisions about positioning, go to market, how we talk about it, figuring out product market fit, uh, which I didn't even know at the time was called product market fit. That's how new I was to all of this startup stuff. Um, but yeah. yeah, it was just, it was an opportunity to just get thrown in and learn so much. And so the founder having such incredible conviction about the opportunity was just totally contagious. In fact, I still have the text message. We have it on our own internal wiki at Bluconic. He sent me a text message after I sent in my paperwork that said, you know, hey, Corey, you know, we got your offer signed. Hurry up and get here. We've got a dream to build. And I remember I just I've never recovered from that moment of just feeling so invigorated to be a part of something like that, working with someone who describes their kind of professional life work in that way. Um, and that was that was all I needed to kind of dive headfirst in. <laughs> Wow, you gave me the chills. That's amazing. You don't you don't hear a story like that often. All right, so you joined the organization, and what was the role they hired you for? Yeah, so director of product marketing, um, which was largely focused on those initial decisions around how do we talk about what we do, what is the value proposition going to be to the market, who are we selling to, both in terms of company sizes, but also the individuals within that organization. What are the problems that we actually solve? Um, so really putting words around what it is that the platform could do, which required me to understand the technology at a deeper level than I had been exposed to, but also get deeper into those personas and just another kind of benefit from Forrester, which has always been fo so focused on personas and roles. Yes. Um, yeah. I had that background. So it was super fun for me to come in and say, okay, here's how I think about this and apply that in a completely different way. Um, and that was that was where it started. And I've lost count. I think it's seven roles since between director of product <laughs> marketing and CEO as I kind of dabbled and moved as the organization needed me to from different kind of functions within the business and sometimes going back and doing it again if the case required it. Right, right. So at the beginning in product mark, when you started with product marketing with them, uh, did they have a sales team? And you know, how, how many years were they into actually selling? Did they have some customers that time? So they had some initial customers, but back in Europe. So they were kind of early yeah. test cases, um, which was, I'd say kind of a mixed blessing in the sense that we had a couple great case studies. But for brands that had no credibility in the U.S., just, you know, the U.S. market likes to hear what everyone who's just in the U.S. or a global brand is doing. So one of the early assignments was literally translating kind of those use cases into a bit more of a generic framework that we could use to go to market. And um, we had a head of sales at the time and a couple of sellers, certainly, who were also kind of just trying to 
break in and get conversations. In a lot of ways, it was a very um, traditional, might be overstating it, but just kind of the BDR cultivation, lots of cold calling, lots of cold yeah. outreach, just to start to get brand reputation and get people to be familiar with us and take those calls. Um, we got our first US customer just after I started in the Boston Globe. Uh, and that was huge because again, you get the brand recognition, you start to be able to parlay that story to other publishers. Um, so that was a core vertical for us really from the get go. Um, and then using that with the sales team to sort of do a lot of enablement and training on the competitive space and how to stand out. But it was, and in a lot of ways, candidly still is today, a very evangelical sale. Again, words I didn't have at the time, but you know, came to understand that you are really trying to paint a picture of the art of the possible for these folks. And you need to be able to sell to them differently when you don't have the brand cachet of a, of a bigger player or someone who's more reputed in the market. All of those kind of things that I don't, I will never take for granted now. I just cherish now that we had to really do all that hard work initially to, to build up. Yeah. Well, okay. So product marketing always needs to be close to sales, right? I mean, salespeople crave what you have, right? Mm -hmm. They need the words. They want the information about the customer and how the product is going to help the customer, the results that we're going to get. It's, it's just absolutely critical. And so many times I see such a mess between product marketing and sales, but it sounds like you dove right in there. It was very early days. I bet those salespeople were your best friends <laughs> trying to, you know, help you and, and uh, work with you to get what they needed. So they had better, more rich and fulfilling conversations with the customers. That was the intention. And and maybe I, who knows how good of a job I did, honestly, I will maybe ask, have to ask them another time. But I think one of the things that was critical to me in those early days that um, you mentioned curiosity, I was happy to be on calls with customers, right? That was two things, again, kind of the benefit of Forrester, very comfortable on the phone with customers. That was what you spent a lot of time being an analyst and a consultant doing. So um, I was, I think, a good partner to sales in that regard of, of being super willing to kind of just get on the call and, and figure it out and talk to them. Um, but then the other side of it was the early start that we got as a company on content and thought leadership and really doing that in a way that was valuable, right? I didn't call it naive. I That's fine. Like I didn't, I wasn't writing anything for SEO. I wasn't writing anything for broad based consumption. I was writing about the problems that our technology solved in the words that I knew we're going to resonate with our market on an authentic level, not an optimized level. And so early on, in terms of my approach to this, uh, it was about how do we talk about these problems and write about them and describe them in ways that are going to resonate in the market? And then how do I support sales in a very active way as well as they learn these things so we can all kind of learn together? Um, and and still to this, I you know, I will always happily get on the phone or get on a call with a prospect or a customer. It's I need to pick my spots a little bit more now, but nothing makes right. me happier than like just getting on and and spitballing with a customer and trying to solve their problems. And um, yeah, there's just so much energy and insight when you get to do that. Yeah. In those early days, that Forrester analyst background really helped you a lot. But I'll tell you what's amazing is having a product marketer who can also write right? It's just very an unusual combination. And so you were able to bring all those years at Forrester of analyzing and having to write about that, right? To the product marketing, which makes you rather unique. You may not recognize that. I definitely did not recognize it. And I will say our product marketing team, maybe that's a legacy of that today, are all better at all of those things than I ever was. So at least I set a good, a good enough bar maybe. And then they've yeah. all catapulted over it time and time again. So I'm very lucky for sure. I love that. All right. So take us on the journey. So you, that's where you started. Uh, explain th the next few roles you had and how you interfaced with sales all along the way. Sure. So my next role was just as VP of marketing kind of overall. Um, so this was still very early days. We had two, maybe three other individuals in the marketing team. Um, and admittedly, I confronted pretty quickly that as much as I love product marketing and some of those pieces, being responsible for overall marketing is not my spike. Uh, I did not enjoy that very much. And so uh, after about, I guess it was a year, maybe two years in that role, I went to our founder CEO, Bart, and just said, 
We obviously are at a critical conjuncture. We definitely need someone who's really good at this in this seat. It's just not me. And I can't kind of keep pretending like this is where I want to be spending my time. Um, and so my expectation was that was going to be a moment actually of departure for me from the company because we were small and scrappy and, you know, every dollar counts. I'm um, right. very fortunate for me that Bart felt differently about that and moved me into this kind of more generic role. We called it SVP of strategy, but really was just an opportunity for me to be put on a lot of our zero to one type of projects and initiatives um, and to play a role that was externally facing with customers to be an asset to sales, um, to build up our RFP library to support our sales engineers and how we talked about the value proposition throughout the demo, right? I, I still think a lot of it was in the form of enablement. How do we talk about what we do in ways that are the right ones at various oh, yeah. altitudes, different stakeholders? And so that was a lot of the next phase and that lasted a couple of years. And then in 2019, um, this is actually the moment where we sort of, I moved as far away from sales as I ever got, and it was only for a little bit of time, but we took our series B at the end of 2019. And um, that's when I became COO and Bart and I made a really deliberate choice about how we split up responsibility for the growing business. He took most of the go-to-market side of things. And I focused on customer success, professional services, people operations, that kind of thing. And so, and then we sort of divided and conquered on product and engineering. and so. I will say that was the furthest away I've been from new business sales, but I still was very much in uh, close responsibility for net retention, gross churn. Um, so revenue functions, even if I was further away from the new business side. But I also, one of the things that I think is a really strongly held pillar of mine now that I have the, the kind of full remit again, is that the best software companies are flywheel companies, right? That every happy customer that tells their story just helps sales on the other side of things. A hundred percent. Right. Nothing novel about that, I guess, but it just being on all sides of it at various times has really strengthened my conviction in that. And I think a lot of that is just driven by people understanding how those pieces connect. And so I did step away from sort of having immediate impact never away from talking to customers. Again, sort of always, that was a draw. And then um, as I moved back into sort of succession planning mode with Bart um, behind the scenes, then took all of that back in, obviously, when I became um, CEO and took over for him last year. But, you know, everybody's in sales at a company our size doing the things that we do. So even even if it was one or two degrees removed, uh, I, never, I never felt very far away from it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, no sales with existing customers is so important. And I, I think that, you know, there was a time when especially funded companies were so focused on new logos that they just really weren't paying enough attention to their existing customers, which like you said, it's a flywheel. It's the best sales department you could have is super satisfied customers who are successfully using what you sold them, who can testify to that and who will tell others about you, right? The Absolutely. word of mouth. I mean, you, you can't beat it, right? So yeah. got to nurture it. You've got to stay close to it. And you really got a very well-rounded experience before you came up to CEO, because a lot of CEOs, as you may know, come up through finance or legal mm -hmm. or ops, they don't get the marketing side of it. They don't get the sales side of it. And so there they are as CEO, really not understanding that as well as they could, especially if they were founders and the inventor, you know, mm -hmm. of things. So, so you are, I'm going to say, you know, very blessed to have <laughs> that really well-rounded view of every aspect of the company as you move into CEO. Sure. And I think it will just make you all the better, right? At being yeah. a CEO. No, I'm sure I totally share your words. I like blessed is the right way to think about it. I'm I'm super, super fortunate. And I think, you know, the thing that I notice now is the way I think about it is I know enough about everything to serve in one of two functions, to be helpful to the people who are actually running those functions at a much higher level. Now I either know where the bodies are buried or can kind of get them up to speed more quickly on things if, as the case may be. But also just I know enough to ask the right questions. Um, and that creates still a lot of space in the middle for people who are professionals at all the things that I may have gotten off the ground. So I have a, a deep reverence and admiration for the skills that they bring because I literally knew I wasn't good enough at them or wasn't passionate about them 
to do it myself or to be able to sustain that. So I, ha I have such respect for what they do while also still being able to be um, like a thought partner or, you know, be in it with them and not feel like, you know, I think a lot of CEOs, if they didn't care about a part of the business, you know, you might neglect it. Um, I love all of it. It's all, it all feels part of it to me. I just know that I can't, uh, I shouldn't and can't do all of those pieces. So I try to balance that. I try to be very aware of those dynamics as much as I can and use them as strengths rather than, you know, getting stuck in a rut or, or have a blind spot about them. So I try. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So today as CEO, what does your sales organization look like and what is your role in sales today? Yeah. So we have an amazing chief revenue officer um, who has consolidated all of the revenue functions um, underneath her purview. So that includes the new business, new logo side of things, as well as our upsell and expansion uh, motion and all of the enablement kind of functions that go underneath that. Uh, an insight for us in particular was around how our customers want to buy and how they use the platform and really needing to make sure that uh, both halves of that land expand motion um, are, are talking the same language and the incentives are aligned. And when we had them separately under different leaders, we were just not sort of setting our customers up for success, which by definition to me means we're not setting ourselves up for success as a business. And so that consolidation took place at the same time I moved into the role uh, last January. So um, that was a kind of first immediate decision that we rolled out basically at the same time. And the virtues of that, as I said, you know, getting that that continuity of the customer experience and journey aligned with how we operationalize that behind the scene. Um, so my role now uh, is really an accountability partner, keeping folks focused on the outcomes that we need to drive. Um, and so, you know, that's I'm a little bit more removed in that regard, but. Uh, I am at everybody's disposal to, again, be a thought partner, to get on the phone, uh, make sure that we are mapping across an entire account. I'm happy to be on the calls with executives, right? Whatever role I can play that will help make sure that we are securing great deals that set the customers up for success. And then, of course, renewing that and ideally expanding that value later on. Um, so, so definitely a little further removed than in the past, but I like to at least hope that the expertise and all of the ways that I have learned over the years can be helpful. I say a lot, you know, nobody's lost more deals at Bluconic than I have. So let me use those battle scars and also kind of create room to learn out loud around, you know, I know how it feels to lose a deal. Trust me. Um, in fact, my first big deal that I ever lost was just totally gut wrenching to the point that uh, I had to call Bart when we finally got the news that we were not winning the business and I was in a conference room and I called to tell him and I hung up the phone and I just put my head down on a table and cried. And I think in that moment, I knew I'm not cut out to be in sales for real, clearly, because I need a thicker skin than I have. Um, but also just like, you know, that's the, the highs and the lows. And, you know, that gives me a level of understanding and empathy that I've been in our reps shoes and I get it. And the only thing you can do is learn from it and get back out there. And that same opportunity called us back a couple of years later. And, uh, and so rightly like, got to leave, leave them better than you came, even if you don't win um, that's paid off for us, but that's not exactly the answer to your question. So that's my, that's my, no, but that's a, that's a great, <laughs> a great point. And I've always said that win or lose, leave them better than before you met them, right? We we want to exit everything gracefully because they will come back, yeah. right? There will be a time when they will need us and they will come back in most cases. So, and I'll tell you that that emotion that you had doesn't make you bad at selling. It means, <laughs> you, it means that you care. You care about your own company. You care about the customer. And when you feel like in sales that a customer didn't buy from you, even though they really needed you, it's hard because you're Ooh. like, oh my gosh, they needed us so much. Why didn't they, you know, take our help? Yep. So that's actually the attributes of a good salesperson. So and you you really are. With really thicker are. skin, I'm telling you, our our amazing salespeople, I learn from them every day and and the ability to push kind of relentlessly, right? Like that's it. To be able to take that kind of feedback so much more regularly than I have had to. Um yeah, I'd get overwhelmed, I think. And I, I admire them very much for their ability to keep coming back at it day in and day out is just a, it's a tenacity that I have in my own form, but that direct rejection, whew, 
you you're you're cut from a special cloth when you can handle that so well. Yeah, it is tough. It is tough. But we'll talk about your sales team a bit more in a minute. I want to go back to um, your role in sales because I think it's just delightful that you really have a great understanding for what sales does, what marketing does, all the departments in your company. But knowing how all of that supports the customer. So, so often, you know, we talk about sales and it's like in a silo, but it's not a sales is about the customer. So mm -hmm. everything, right. Everything is really in the end. It's about the customer. And you guys seem to have that really um, pinpointed customer focus, which is so important. We're all working for the same thing to make our customers delighted, to make them successful using what we sold them. And that's why I love a true CRO role there are a lot of CROs that are just inflated titles and they're not really overall revenue. So, so I say that with a little bit, you know, uh, apprehension, but in, in what you're describing, you have a true CRO role. They are looking at over all of the revenue, right? Which is so important. But in your role as CEO now, your team has to use you wisely, right? Mm -hmm. You're busy. You have now the whole the weight of the whole company on your shoulders. <laughs> you know, your founder is still probably over there, very supportive, but very still supportive. that weight is on you, right? And so um, as a CEO, you only have a certain amount of time to dedicate to sales, although it sounds like it is one of your priorities, which mm -hmm. is so important. So tell us how your sales team uh, comes to you and lets you know, hey, we need you on this call or we need you to talk to this senior level person at this company and how they prepare you for that so that you are really, you know, in a great space when you do go out and talk to that customer or jump on a call with them. Sure. So I think, you know, to your point about time management and even my own self that I would happily just jump on a call because someone asked me, the really the big question is always, how does this move the deal forward or the renewal forward. And the answer can be honestly, Corey, we're stuck. Like we're trying to, but that's fine. That, that at least yeah. we're being clear about that. Um, and so then, and that's also a different conversation, right? So it's, it's being clear about what is the role that I am playing in the process that we're running again, renewal, you know, they may be feeling a little frustrated, give me the temperature of what kind of the conversation is that I need to have. Uh, and that's again, true if I'm just supporting a new business deal or as the executive sponsor for our existing customers that I'm aligned to. Um, so really being clear about what it is I'm being called in to do. And then within that, most importantly, the person or people that I'm gonna be talking to, tell me about them. What is keeping them up at night? What are their concerns? what makes them seem to light up, right? Just give me context around what it is that I'm kind of walking into. If they're a skeptic, that can be fine. If it's just to make them feel really good that, you know, I'm the CEO reached out. Right? Like, it can be a lot of different things. Um, I'm the first to admit, like I will BDR for anybody at, at any time, as long as it's clear you've tried and you can't get in or whatever, like, yeah, let me know. Send me a note, give me the email. I will happily write anybody a message and try to get connected. And so um, I'm partially to enforce my own time management around that. I can't do that for everybody at all times, but I think our team is, is process oriented enough and understands where I can add value and where once I'm used, that's kind of burned also, right? So don't, don't use it too soon or too small because it's hard to go above my head after that. The next time you get somebody who's a little bit higher up. And the other thing I would just say is, really being focused for us as an organization on understanding that our hands-on keyboard users may be the biggest advocates in the world. If they don't hold the budget, then we need to make sure that the people above them are really happy or find out who those people are. And so that's a team effort, right? Both the customer success manager, the account manager, the old AE, me, whoever it is, to make sure that we have very clear alignment that I know what the CMO or the chief data officer, whoever that most senior person is, what do they care about? What is what is losing sleep for them? And how do what we do then down the line sort of translate and identify if the person at the top of the chain is saying something completely different than the people who are running use cases in our platform, somebody needs to link those things up because at some point, budget is gonna get called into question and we need to make sure we're aligned there. So a couple of different places that I get pulled in um, and, it's for me, it's again, all about how is this advancing our goals toward securing whatever revenue it is, wherever we are in that life cycle. 
Yeah, it sounds like you've got a great process for that. And I love that you're willing to BDR. I think so many CEOs now just are like, well, that's their job. That's the salespeople's job. Yes, but you have the title founder or CEO. You can open doors. Totally. The salespeople aren't asking you to do their job. They're asking you to open the door. Mm -hmm. And that is the CEO's role. I mean, that is a super important role to play. And being out there on social media like you are as well is helpful because you know, your whole, your whole company is producing content and you're out there and that helps people, you know, be drawn to you, which is, is important as well. Let's Ryan. talk about your sales organization now and what that looks like. And there's something very special about your sales organization's leaders, which I want you to share. So we have Jackie as a CRO, right? Yes. And um, so female CEO, female CRO, what a great combination. <laughs> Um, tell us about the rest of your uh, sales organization and, and how that's formed and how the leadership is. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, have a VP of new business sales um, named Kate, who is amazing. Uh, and then we have our head of sort of expansion customer revenue. So account management functionally uh, in Janelle. And then actually our head of our alliances team who reports into uh, our marketing function just because it's more top of funnel, but is obviously very dotted line into Jackie and closely aligned with the rest of the revenue leadership um, is Lindsay. So we're uh, we're five for five on that top of the the, the revenue pyramid being, being ladies, which, um, you know, I think I was actually talking to one of our board members who is the former CRO at Hootsuite and is now um, the managing director, one of the managing directors at Vista. Um, and she made the point, you know, this is just, you you're when you get need to get into networks that you don't otherwise have right and it's it's definitely an example i think of um being able to attract different talent by virtue of the fact that we've made it into some of those spaces and so we have this just absolutely rock star team um and then they said the coordination that happens because we have those great working relationships under one revenue organization ensure that we are closing good deals. Like I having run the customer organization, I, we need new business. We need new logos. Do not throw trash over the, over the hill at, at the customer org. I am, I am very emphatic about that. Now that's not to say that you don't sometimes need to close a deal that might be a little bit quirky or, you know, there might be a good reason to do it. It's going to be unusually challenging, but let's do that with eyes wide open and in a collaborative way and in an honest, transparent way rather than just being like, yeah, this deal is perfect. And then the minute you get it over to CS um, or to the PS team, it's just a tire fire. So uh, Jackie also having a background on the customer organization, she was our chief customer officer before she moved into the CRO role. So she also has that very high degree of empathy internally for making sure that we are doing the right things by the customer. And you know, customer getting thrown over doesn't just piss off the internals, it also pisses off the customer. So right, like everybody loses when we do that poorly. So that appropriate setting of expectations, how do we all work together really in this revenue as a team sport perspective, while also candidly having healthy friction, right? It shouldn't just be whatever it takes all the time. That's how companies get into trouble. But if we do this in a way that is, uh, again, collaborative internally, holding each other accountable, then I think we can, you know, make sure that nine out of 10 times we're doing the right thing. It's not going to be perfect every time, but that, that participation, learning out loud, supporting each other uh, and doing that in a way that really crystallizes this view of if it's good for the customer and in a, in a way that we can defend, not that the customer is always right either, to be fair, um, but really just, you know, how do we make sure our customers are set up for success? That could include walking away from a deal, quite frankly, right? Or breaking up with a customer. We want to avoid that. And we do that by having really strong clarity and alignment around who it is that we're going after, why we're going after them and supporting each other and doing that. Um, and I think that structure has served us very well. Right. Not all business is good business, right? It's important to be choosy on the way in, right? So you don't have to be cleaning house, right? That's right. All the that's time. Right. We want we want a customer for life. And that's a customer that's a win-win fit that we can serve. Um, so I, I really love that attitude that your team has. That's amazing. Absolutely. So I want to ask you a little bit about taking over for a founder, right? Because that's a really interesting thing. And I imagine because this is such an, a, an unusual company in terms of, you know, it sounds like the clarity around things, the vision that the founder had and the P 
people who are there, you know, all really bought into that. So they've been there a while. Mm -hmm. How was it taking over for a founder? Yeah. So I um, owe Bart more debts of gratitude than can probably ever be repaid. Uh, I'm trying. Um, but, you know, just even in the first place of bringing me on board um, and giving me the chances that I had and then all of the roles that I have, I mean, just to really put a finer point on it, I've literally never had the same job twice. I am profoundly unqualified every time I start a new job. And so the opportunity that I have been given now, whatever it is, five or six times over by Bart and the belief that he has in me um, is a pretty extraordinary example of sponsorship that I just don't think a lot of people ever get, never mind someone who, uh, debatably deserving of it as, as we went through. Um, so when it was time to take over, I think the real strength was like, he was fully behind me. This was a, this was a thoughtful succession plan. Um, he made it really clear that part of me taking over was something he valued as part of his own legacy. Um, that's really, really important and really powerful. And I, again, cherish that every single day. It also meant that when the time came to hand over, um, we did it together. You know, we were sitting side by side when this happened and um, he was so full throated in how that went. And I had so much history in the company that um, I'm a known quantity in a lot of ways. So yes, it's meant different things. My, my role in the company and how I can interact and a lot of that, of course, has had to change. But at the same time, um, I, I like to think at least like there wasn't a pre CEO and a post CEO Corey. I'm, I'm pretty consistent in terms of how I show up. And so, you know, that the credibility that I had built in the organization, coupled with his vote of confidence in me, the whole management team rallying behind that and being fully on board. Um, I think probably as far as these things go, I haven't been part of many, but it, it feels pretty seamless from what I understand. And he's just been a huge champion um, from the get go. And, and so, and that continues to this day, even as he has stepped out of the day to day, uh, I know he's always a call or a text or a, you know, coffee away if I need him. So. Wow. Again, blessed. I, I love that for you that you're so supported and you had such a great ally in your, your, um, founder, which is a, an amazing place to be. And I, I know that great things, have been occurring and will continue <laughs> to occur with you at the helm there. So that's, that's awesome. So before we part ways today, I have three quick questions for you. Um, and here we go. They're going to be on the screen so you can see them, but we, we discussed them a little bit beforehand. Um, and I see that you have a vast bookshelf like I do behind me so that you probably have lots of favorite books, but what is a book or you can name a few books that you think every CEO should read? Sure. I, as you rightly identify for everyone who's watching this visually, um, books are kind of my thing. Uh, I love, love, love nothing more than to read. And I think one of my joys is reading a lot of things that I think um, you can learn a lot of lessons from unexpected places. I guess the, the book that I would suggest that has been really critical for how I've been thinking about what we're doing at work right now has been James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. And this idea that systems are more important than goals, um, that is a really anchoring conviction for me and how we talk about the company and our own strategy and what we're doing there. So uh, while I could name a bunch of them, that's probably been the most influential for me, just especially since I've taken over for uh taking over in the role. Um, but I'll also tell you, as I said, I get a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places. And probably there are folks out there who've read the Sarah Moss books, A Court of Thorn and Ash, or Thorn, Court of Thorn and Roses. But she has this other series that has just an amazing um, female protagonist. And one of my observations from all the series that Sarah Moss has written is she has this very acutely excellent view of the burden of leadership and how hard it is to be someone who people look to uh, especially as a woman and all of those pressures. Um, so honestly, like those, they're super escapist. They're wonderful reads, like super entertaining. But one of the, the key themes is that in her series, 
I'm really struck by how beautifully she kind of describes those burdens and the weight of that. So maybe not for every CEO to read, but sort of a surprising inspiration for me that I didn't get. And then the last one I will say, because we use the word my board member, Melissa, that I mentioned, gave it to me. It was a book called Wonder Woman, um, which is all about how you kind of find yourself and your joy in your work for women who are particularly high achieving. And so since you use the word wander, I think I'd be remiss not to mention that that one I read in my first couple of weeks as I transitioned last year um, and was and was super valuable to me as well. Well, you've given me a couple new things to put on my list. So I really appreciate that. And definitely Wonder Woman is going on there. So amazing. Awesome. All right. The next one is, um, what is a podcast that you listen to that makes you think differently? Yeah, I'll give you two and they'll be briefer. Uh, Plain English with Derek Thompson. He writes for The Atlantic, um, but he every episode is something new and different that he tries to put into plain English. And it's a great range. Um, and then the other one that I've been loving is Acquired, which has been on for years and years, but they do one episode a month and they're like four hours, if not longer. And I love going deep, as I mentioned, into things. And I just respect the heck out of being able to listen to the most in-depth take on Taylor Swift as a business that could ever be imagined or on Hermes. Um, so those podcasts make me think differently about the craft of what they are doing and how to think about these stories and the details, but also the actual kind of case studies that they're focused on. So Plain English and Acquired are the two that I would say have been making me think very differently. Excellent. I will have to tune into those. And the last question is, what do you think, or what, what does every CEO, let me start that again. Hang on. <laughs> what does every CEO need to know to win in this marketplace? Who their customers are and what they care about. Full stop. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. It has been absolutely delightful to listen to you hear, share your story with our audience. I know that um, this will be a podcast that will have a lot of listeners because uh, your story is it's insightful. It gives us lots of you know ideas and, and new ways to think. So I really appreciate you being on the show. Well, honored for the opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe and we'll see you next week.